Greetings, friends, and welcome to episode number 64 of Nostalgia Talk. Overture, curtain lights, this is it. <laughs> We'll hit the heights. No more rehearsing and rehearsing apart. We know every part by heart. Yeah, if you guys know that song, leave a comment below. Um, before I introduce the guest, I just have a couple of things I want to talk about. Uh, as they say, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. Uh, I'll start with the bad news first, because whenever I tell my friends, I got good news and bad news, they're like, bad news first. <laughs> the good news will make you happy. So um, as you probably are aware, if you're in Nova Scotia, recently, my home province has been struck by wildfires. Now, thankfully, I have not been in any of the affected areas. There was a fire in my community, but it wasn't that massive and it was it was under control in nearly a half an hour. Some people have lost their homes. There were a lot of evacuation orders. I've actually got my phone right with me just in case of an Amber Alert or an evacuation order. I usually don't do that. I mean, I always have my phone near me when I'm recording, but this time I'm, I've am i I've got it in case there is an alert, which I don't think there will be because we got a lot of rain today, but you never know, you know, like it, it, it stuff, stuff could happen. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so... If you guys, if any of you guys have been affected by the wildfires, I'm keeping you all in my thoughts. And now for the good news. One of the really nice things about doing this podcast is the fact that after I do the shows, I stay very close with a lot of my guests. And recently, one of my friends who was on the show, Serena Berman, got married. You guys remember Serena? She was Lucy in a couple of Peanuts specials. She was on Witch, Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide, and Justice League. So, Serena, big congratulations to you. And now let's get uh, the ball rolling. Joining me this time around is Keith Scott. And Keith, since you're in Australia, g'day. Hey there. Nice to nice to be on the show, and thank you for asking me. <laughs> well, it's really good to have you here. For anybody who doesn't know, Keith is a voice actor, impressionist, comedian, and animation historian. And in his career, he has done some of the most iconic animation characters out there. Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, Sylvester the Cat, Elmer Fudd, Bullwinkle, Fearless Leader, Boris Badenov, Scooby-Doo, Yogi Bear, Huckleberry Hound, Fred Flintstone. I, I could honestly uh, be here uh, for the entire show if I just went over every cartoon character that there was, but uh, then we wouldn't get to uh, the interview. So, you know, that, and that's kind of why everyone uh, comes back here. But Keith has done these characters for TV commercials, movies, TV appearances, video games, and even theme parks in Australia. So, it's really nice to have you here. Thanks very much, James. It's terrific to be here. And and um, actually, it even extended to uh, theme parks in the U.S. because um, for a few years there, I was doing the Jay Ward character voices for the uh, Universal theme park in Universal City in Los Angeles, of course, but, uh, but also the one in Orlando, Florida. Uh, so... Uh, I was Dudley Do Right on the Ripsaw Falls ride, and uh, and, and also Popeye and the old Bluto, you know, the the cinema. The well, blow Bluto. me down. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. I and, did not uh, know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I for a little while there, and so my voice is still apparently on the ride in Florida, in Orlando, for the um, Flume ride. I think it's called with Popeye and Bluto. So. Uh, um, those things tend to last for years, you know, um, probably the people who, who come out in costume and do the characters have probably all grown up and their kids are now doing the same thing, but I did them back in the late nineties, these tracks. And, uh, then I did some more of the, the, I think, um, the Warner brothers stuff that I was, um, approved to do in the uh, Australia, New Zealand region back in 89, just after Mel Blanc died. The reason for that was that they were suddenly, you know, because the master has gone, <clears throat> they began looking for all sorts of replacements. And uh, I think even then they didn't really know, apart from the idea of Tiny Toons, um, that there was going to be any projects except, you know, they were hoping for, for to continue the characters now that Mel Blanc had passed. Mm -hmm. um so there's all sorts of reasons that they they go scouting for people who can mimic these sort of characters and uh um a friend of mine is uh jeff bergman who's very successful as you know in in the u.s doing the ca the characters currently he first started in the same year i did back in 89 90 um doing this and then um for various reasons uh he had to move back to his um home state in pittsburgh 
well, in Pennsylvania, sorry. And um, it's sort of only really in around about 2008 when he moved to L.A. full time that he reverted to doing all those characters he does so well, you know? Yeah. And it's so funny it's, that you. It's... Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, no. That's... I was waiting for the next question. <laughs> Well, I was going to I was going to say it's funny that you um, mentioned um, having the tracks still there for the theme parks after all these years. I went to Disneyland uh, maybe about eight years ago and we saw uh, Mickey Mouse uh, kind of like doing a little performance. Yes. And the voice yes. was Wayne Allwine, who was the Mickey Mouse right. I grew up with, who did who did Mickey for 30 years. And I looked at my dad. I was like, this must have been recorded a long time ago. My dad's like. How can you tell? I said, because that's Wayne Allwine doing Mickey and Wayne is not with us anymore. And another person next to us was like, yes. how does he know that? <laughs> I know it's always the, the you always get accused of being a geek, you know, a fact like that, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. well, I've been a geek all my life and proud of it, I suppose. But uh, uh, yeah, no, I, I did did a lot of this stuff and um, it does still exist, but uh, the the biggest one that I, I was really lucky to do was the the cartoons that I was most uh, in love with as a little kid were the Jay Ward ones, you know, um, The Adventures of Rocky and Bull, and Dudley Do-Right, and um, George of the Jungle. And um, <clears throat> when I was in, in high school, I, I started writing to these voice artists because I just fell in love with it so much. And then when you're that young, you, you tend to think somehow I'm going to go into doing that business, but at that stage, you do not know how you're going to do it, you know. <clears throat> well, the, these... These people in Hollywood were uh, more helpful than I expected. I thought they may be too busy to even answer me, but uh, I got letters from um, Doss Butler, who, you know, Huckleberry Hound, Yogi Bear, and all of those yep. great Hanna Barbera characters, and June Foray um, uh, from, you know, she's Rocky and Natasha, of course, and uh, and then she put me on to Bill Scott, who was the real key to it all, because he was, as you probably know, the whole history, he was Jay Ward's um, partner. He was a sidekick, uh, yeah. And uh, and really the creative plug of the studio because he was the the head writer for all the years Jay Ward Productions was in business, and also got cast as the lead voices: Bullwinkle, Dudley Do Right, Mister Peabody, uh, George of the Jungle, all of these great characters, you know. So uh, I was really um, you know lucky to meet all these people when I went to LA in '73. I was only like 19, and um, they took me under their their collective wings and and kind of knew that I was. Um, it was almost like they they said, oh, well, when we do go years from now, this will be a person we can pass the torch to, you know, because I was so enthusiastic. And they were joking that I knew more about the history of the show than they did, and they created it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, you know, it was that sort of uh, obsessive thing. But mm. but mixing that historical um, bent in my nature with the fact that I was also mimicking voices for my whole life. So, you know, they, they could see... Um, that, uh, boy, you know, you'll not only write a book about us, which I didn't believe, and then sure enough, 20 years later, I did. Yeah. Um, but but um, you'll you'll even do the voice, you know. <laughs> and um, and Bill Scott even gave me tips on, you know, the way he approaches certain voices like Bullwinkle and so on. Uh, he, said, he said, a lot of people think it's just a dumb guy, you know. But he said, no, he said, Bullwinkle, you got to play him like a very smart goof. <laughs> mm. You know, so he the fact that he um, really was the the heart, the heart and soul of that character, that was sort of like a, a, a little inside tip from the master, you know. So all of this stuff was was just overwhelming to me when I was in my late teens. And little did I know now that I'm an old guy that uh, it would have become a whole career, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's kind of the potted background of my crazy life in doing all of these voices. Well, that actually was going to be my first question, how you became interested oh. in voice acting. And I, I figured that it was through watching all of these um, cartoons. And I was going to ask also, what was like the big one for you? Uh, and looks like it was Jay Ward and Bill Scott, you know, all that stuff. It, and, it you know, was, the, but it, it, it actually began with the Hanna-Barbera stuff because we, we, we got a TV set, I think, in 59 when I was only like six Right. Um, and the Jay Ward cartoons weren't sold to overseas until 1960, the following year. So really, my um, love affair with all this stuff began with the, the Huckleberry Hound show and Rough and Ready, you know. And um, so, in fact, the very first character I ever learned to impersonate in school was uh, was that great voice that Doris Butler did, Mr. Jinx, you know. It was like, like, uh, like I'm going to clap a little miserable me-state Mises to pieces like... Uh, 
you know, so that was such a great character. And, uh, and uh, of course, everyone in school was doing these voices, but I, for some reason, I just had some sort of affinity for doing them a bit more authentic, um, other than just a hobby type thing, you know, or, a, or a, oh, I saw this cartoon last night and Sylvester said this. Or <laughs> in fuckatash. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you said that you wrote to Dawes Butler, and I actually read that as I was researching for this. Did you ever actually get the chance to meet him? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I became okay. a, a very close friend of his from 73 when I met him. He, I wrote to him in 1970, and I got a really great letter, and um, he he um, remembered me as if it had been the day before when I got to that trip in L.A. when I was, uh, I think I said I was 19 going on 20, because I'd won a trip to go there. So what nice. happened was that when I wrote to June Foray, not only was it um, great to get a letter from her, but by sheer coincidence at that time, uh, she she had met someone a year younger than me who had the same you know crazy passion for all of this. And, uh, you know, his name, Corey Burton. Yep. Um, Corey is actually I've known Corey for years, actually. He's a oh, great, he's a great guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, well, I've known Corey since 1971 when June Foray put us together as pen pals, believe it or not. Oh, nice. Um, and and he was still in high school and and I was, um, I guess, a year and a bit older. And um, and so, you know, uh, he uh, he'd already been taken by June Foray to watch a recording session with the Jay Ward people. He may have told you all of this stuff. Actually, I've very... I've never I've never heard any of this from oh. him. I'll I'll have I'll have to ask him what's June for yeah. like. Hi, Corey, if oh, you're listening. Yes. <laughs> yes, no, he, she, she was uh, very helpful. Um, I think she could tell that you know that the interest was so deep with us that we were serious. It wasn't just like some person who wanted an autograph and they'd never see him again. So that's why they kind of took Corey and myself seriously. That uh, we really knew our stuff and and really did love their stuff that they produced and i guess it was flattering to them you know even even paul freeze who was you know a little um intimidating because he was so um famous as the voice of all these great things like uh the haunted mansion you know the the ghost host yeah and, and for and any of the all... listeners who have never heard of paul freeze he's uh you've probably heard his uh his voice before he's uh, he has a very very big gruff kind of voice mm -hmm. he did Boris Badenov in uh, right. the Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoons. He was uh, the original Ludwig von Drake. Uh, and mm. he was also in a lot of the Rankin Bass holiday specials. So just listen for a voice like this. And that's most likely Paul Freese. Yes. Yeah. Well, he did that great um, <clears throat> narration on the, the haunted mansion at Disneyland. So a lot of people would have heard that, you know, when hinges creak in doorless chambers. And strange and frightening sounds echo through the halls. You know, mm -hmm. that sort of voice. And uh, um, yes, Corey, of course, took over Ludwig von Drake, you know. Um, I remember when he got the original session tapes of Paul Fries recording, a, I think it was an album in like 1960, 61, as Professor Ludwig, and, um, and realized that they sped his voice up slightly to do this, you know. Um, same as they sped Mel Blanc's voice up slightly for Daffy and Porky Pig and uh, Speedy Gonzalez, those little boy, Tweety, of course, a little baby voice. <laughs> but yeah, they sped Ludwig on, von Drake up. So he, to hear the original tapes, it gave you an idea of what Paul Free sounded like doing it before it was sped. And that's how Corey mastered the imp impersonation of Ludwig when, uh, when he passed away and, and he, he inherited the role. Um, so, you know, this is, this is the level of, of craziness that we went to, to, uh, try and master all these characters, you know, slowing records down and learning how they did it. And I remember when I was a kid, I, I uh, had one of those capital records of all the old Warner brothers, the Looney Tunes stuff. And, um, it was, I think you played it then on a turntable at 45 RPM, mm -hmm. if you, really old technology. And, uh, oh, oh, my, oh yeah, my, my sister has back. a record player. Yeah. Yeah, they're coming back. Yeah. Um, so I slowed the uh, that 45 one down to 33 to hear him when he did uh, at, the, at the end of all of them. They they had the little sped porky pig saying that's all, folks. And it was, you know, instead of the it was like uh, hearing Mel's voice. That's all, folks. And then if they sped that up, it was the cartoon voice, you know. Right. So all these little things back in the years before today's technology and digital uh, era that we live in now. Uh, it was just our way of stumbling along and learning all this crazy stuff, you know? 
Right. So it became not only a hobby, but a job. That's why I always say, you know, you, people like us can be lucky because um, your hobby is your job and your job becomes your hobby, you know. Right. So yeah, people when often, you often who, who don't get it will say things to me like, you know, you're still interested in all this stuff all these years <laughs> later, all these decades later. And I say, yeah, yeah, of course. I'm going to I'm going to put on a cartoon in a minute. You know, <laughs> they just don't get it. <laughs> right. So when you were aspiring to uh, want to do a uh, voiceover, like uh, I've, I, as I said in the intro, you know, you did a lot of commercials and theme park attractions mm -hmm. in Australia and right. um, and and you also said that it expanded. But when you were younger, did you ever think I'm going to move to L.A. and become a voice actor? I I did, of course. Everyone thinks that, I suppose. But um, it as but it like but out, like was that but like was that the dream? Yeah, that was that was the, the dream. Yes, it, it definitely was. In fact, that trip that I I won in in seventy three uh, was just after I'd known Corey for like a year and a half, and and suddenly I entered this this there was this TV the local TV guide. I think it was called TV Times, and they had a competition: win a trip to Hollywood. You know, all you have to do is answer these three movie trivia questions. And tell us in 25 words or less why you'd like to go. Well, the movie trivia was my meat, so I, they were easy to answer that. But my, I think my answer was so weird to them, you know, talked about, you know, that I was um, a fan of all these um, behind the scenes voiceover people. And in those days, back in 73, I think it, it just seemed so eccentric and out there that they said, let's let this guy win. It's going to be a great story we can put in the magazine, you know, because <laughs> they had somebody over there for the first week or so who um, took us around to all of the attractions and things, you know, Disneyland and all of that uh, as tourists. And then I, I uh, my grandparents knew how uh, fanatic I was back then. So they gave me a, a little present of some money to to have two extra weeks in LA. And I that's when I got to know all these people and, and I was on my own, you know, and uh, it was a kind of a life changer, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that that really was one of the things that made me think, yeah, I guess I will move here one day. But as it turned out, I I, I was lucky enough to become so busy doing um, voiceover work in, in Australia and also being a stand-up impressionist on weekends in clubs, you know, like uh, right. John Biner and all these sort of guys, that um, it, it really just, I just got so busy that... Um, I wouldn't have had time to, you know, I was, I was making a good living, I guess. And uh, then later on, after I'd been in it for all these years, the older guys did start dying. You know, like, I think Bill Scott went first and then Paul Fries, then D D uh, Doris Butler in 1988 and Mel Blank the following year and mm -hmm. Jay Ward the same time. So it was like, that's when I, I just started thinking, I wonder if they're going to start you know, say, take for instance the Jay Ward Productions thing. I wonder if they'll ever, now that these guys are dead, will they revive the characters? Will there be all these thoughts were going around a moment? So I put down a demo um, just on the off chance that they might use some voices, maybe, who knows, 10 years down the track. I had no idea. This was in 1990. And, um, and I sent the, I, I know, I took the, it shows you how things have changed. This was on a cassette. <laughs> oh yeah cassettes are yeah. cool yeah well they're even they're making a comeback if you if you read the internet you know some people uh, oh yeah like old... i my one of my friends yeah. gave me a walkman for christmas and i've ah, been great. upping my great. cassette collection old <laughs> and new <laughs> yeah and of course now the now you can copy all that old analog stuff and, and preserve it but uh um so anyway, I, I, did, I recorded this demo of, uh, I think if you, if you want to access it, it's on my website that says okay. J Ward voices demo, you know? Um, and, um, I, I took it with me on a cassette master and I had three copies of it and it gave it to Tiffany Ward at the shop, the old Dudley do right Emporium. It was next door to the J Ward studio, sort of like a J Ward gift store. And, um, just on the off chance no no actually the first person because i knew june for a for years and years by now i um told her i was in town doing some research and she said oh we must go to dinner and she got Corey burton and myself uh to go out to dinner uh, that about two nights after i got there in 1991 and i gave her this cassette and I said, I'm doing some of these voices just in case they ever revive your your lovely Rocky and Bullwinkle project. And she said, oh, I hope so, you know. And so she took her the cassette home 
And she must have thought it sounded authentic, the voices, because she called her agent in, in like midnight and played it to him over the telephone. It's a cassette. <laughs> that shows you the technology. And, I can just um, imagine it would, it would have sounded so yeah. muffled like Charlie Brown's teacher. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wah, 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 so, wah, wah. Yeah. And then, well, it was like that. It was like that. Well, it was almost like Twilight Zone music because the next morning oh. her agent called me at the hotel and and by coincidence, his his office was right across the street from me. I didn't even know. Holy and, shit. And, he, and he had this little high pitched voice. His name was Don Pitts. He's he's no longer, but he used to represent everyone, like everyone from Mel Blanc in their last years, Paul Freeze. And he said, uh, hey, uh, um, John, John Frey played me your demo on the, on the telephone last night. I, I really, I, I'd, I'd like to represent you for work when you're in, in, in America. And I, you know, I nearly fell out, uh, fell off the bed when you know, I was listening to him. And then when he said, um, my address is in Highland Avenue, I said, that's where I am. I said, I'm in the Holiday Inn right across the street. He said, oh my God. He said, well, I'll see you in five minutes, come to the office. And and he took me on as a client. And, and this is just because on the audience spent, you know, 20 bucks recording a quick demo of all these voices a few weeks before in Sydney, wondering if, if I'll ever get a call about this. So it just goes to show you, sometimes you just don't know what's around the corner, you know, it's like one of these, and that was one of those dream come true moments for sure, you know. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Um, what? So you, you said that you knew Jay Ward and Bill Scott. Uh, what were they like? Just great, you know, they, they, um, once once they relaxed and um and knew that you you were a real serious student they were very flattered uh bill scott was um, a very nice guy considering he was such a genius of writing and uh and just doing everything uh, and the career that he had had you know like he'd been when he was young he'd been with warner brothers for a couple of years as a writer for the story man and so, so he was partnered with uh, lloyd turner who was one of jay ward's writers wrote a lot of the fractured fairy tales and um and um so he was he was great he took me to lunch and and gave me the whole history and i didn't even have a recorder to record it but everything stayed locked in my brain and that a lot of that uh was that was the day he said you'll write a book about us one day you know <laughs> um so he was he was great and he remained a uh, he he used to send me letters and uh, anything I wanted to ask he'd he'd clarify if I were if I wanted to know about his days at the UPA studio when they did the Magoo cartoons uh he'd send me a letter and and describe it all this is the you know snail mail era you know 20 yep. years before the internet was invented mm -hmm. um so all of that was just um great and then once I had been in the the voiceover business for a few years I was making enough of a living that I was then, in, starting in 79, I was able to go across to LA once a year as a, like a, a kind of a um, educating myself type of trip um, and adding to my knowledge all the time. So on that one, that was one of the trips where I was able to uh, um, go to a couple of the J Ward recording sessions. And that was, again, one of those, my head exploding moments, you know, because here I am sitting in a studio the way it was back in the in the days they were doing Rocky and Bullwinkle, watching these Captain Crunch commercials, and there's Doris Butler, Paul Fries, and Bill Scott in the same room, <laughs> and it's and then later on after the session, because Corey Burton was uh, at a session himself, and he arrived just he just missed seeing Paul Fries, who lived up in San Francisco. He had to take off real quick, but he he took some photos of uh, of the day there, and uh, and then we were talking to Bill Scott later on. You know, uh, just like fans then, even though we were still in the same business as him by now, mm -hmm. uh, we were still like young fans um, saying, you know, when you did Mr. Peabody, how did, how did you come up with that voice? All this sort of stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So we were lucky enough to come from that generation where they were still alive and with it and uh, able to impart all of this knowledge. And so in, in a sense, I, I look back and think, I wonder if this was all meant to happen because we got to them in plenty of time, you know. It wasn't like they were on their deathbed, you know. Right. Did you by any chance see the Mr. Peabody and Sherman movie that came out a couple of years ago? No, I, I still okay. haven't. Uh, okay. But, um, I heard actually heard some good things about it. Yeah, I mean, I um, 
I, I never, I have to admit, I never watched the original Mr. Peabody. I have watched the Rocky and Bullwinkle show, like the old Rocky and Bullwinkle show where that right. was in, but I don't remember Mr. Peabody being in it. I mean, oh, from, okay. the, from the film, it definitely looks like a Jay Ward and Bill Scott cartoon. Like yes. they kept that yeah. very, very true. Um, yeah. They made it also very um, staying with the times in many ways. Mm-hmm. As well, yeah. uh, and yeah. I also noticed that um, the Rocky and Bullwinkle movie adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle did that. Yeah. I, I, I'm just going to say, I really do love that film. Yeah, good, good. It's Cause it so, got some really bad reps. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's too bad really. And it's, it's funny. I was talking to Corey about this a while ago. He told me that you both auditioned for the narrator and then he ended up getting the narrator for Dudley do right. Yeah, that's then right. You ended up on the Rocky and Bullwinkle movie. Uh, did you audition for the Dudley do right movie? No, I, I, I got there and heard that it was um, also a going thing. Cause I think at that time, Tiffany Ward was trying to really revive all of her father's properties, but I hadn't even heard um, in the lead up to coming over for Rocky and Bullwinkle. Um, I hadn't even heard that the Dudley was un, was under consideration, so mm-hmm. that was a surprise. And I was glad that you know it worked out that we both got one of those pictures each. But I was um, see Tiffany wanted me for the Rocky and Bullwinkle one by hook or by crook because I'd done three years before I'd done the George of the Jungle movie for her. Right. She cast me. She insisted on them using me um, because she also got a copy of that same demo that June Foray got. And uh, on that, I was doing um, the Paul Freeze narrator voice, I think, from a Dudley do right cartoon. Um, but that was the same style of voice he used to narrate the old seven minute George of the Jungle cartoons, you know. Right. And um, <clears throat> of course, I was directed away from that. Once once I got to that job in 1997, the, the film director, the guy who directed the Brendan Fraser movie, yep. um, thought you know and I get, he was probably right that really that paul freeze voice all the way through the movie might get a bit monotonous in just one tone so it ended up being a combination of the paul freeze and gary owens you know the great voice of roger ramjet and yep. laughing and <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> one and gary only owens. legendary yeah yes <laughs> he was an, another great guy um that i got to know I was so lucky. I got to meet all the legends that I grew up with. I was and, just uh, about to say, that's amazing. Yeah. It is. It's scary because even <laughs> back in 19, 1985 um, in Sydney, um, Mel Blanc was famous around the whole world at that time because he'd been on those um, American Express commercials where he's on camera. He was an old guy by then, but he came up and said, hi, you don't know me. Uh but uh, I'm the voice of, uh, and then he'd go, yeah, what's up, Jack? And then, uh, but he said, uh, so that's why I carry the American Express card. Either the, the, you know, so the whole world saw these. That ads. sounded a little bit like Casey Kasem there. <laughs> yeah, I need to wear headphones to make sure I don't veer from one to another. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so um, what happened? Uh, he he was so famous because of these commercials that he was a celebrity for about a year um, and they invited him to come to Australia to do the um, local TV awards, annual TV show as a guest. And, Mm -hmm. um, and so when he was doing an interview on one of the local radio stations, an FM station, one of the guys at the TV station who knew me very well arranged for me to meet Mel Blanc. And uh, I had no idea he was even in Australia. So I, I get there and and um and the the guys at the station knew me for years as you know coming in doing all their crazy commercials so he Mel Blanc guy accepted me as a guy who's a, as a total pro it wasn't like I even had to pretend I was a fan or anything and they they got me to do Elmer Fudd while he did a Bugs Bunny script that they'd written you mm-hmm. know just a little promo and um and then I did um, Jack Benny because Mel Blanc used to be a stooge on his radio show for years and years. And um, <laughs> I did Jack Benny and he did the little Mexican character. I don't know if you know that that bit where um, it's Mel Blanc used to get huge laughs from just one syllable. It was like uh, Benny would say, oh, oh, mister, are you? He was a little Mexican guy with a big sombrero hat. He said, are you waiting for the train? See. 
Oh, oh yeah, I do your, know this routine. Yeah, yeah with Jack yeah, Benny. What's your yeah. name? Sai. Sai. So we did that routine together. And that morning, I get out of bed knowing I'm going to go to a radio station to meet Mel Blank, and I had no idea they were going to ask me to do bits with him, the most legendary voice man of all time. So it really is. I, as you say, it's like one of those bizarre things. I look back now and say, I don't. Now I can look back and say I didn't even realize at the time how lucky I was. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. What and what was Mel Blank like? Because as you said, the most famous voice in yeah. the world, basically. Like, um, you know, and. and you know, he's one of those people that it's like he's one of the most famous people in the world mm. and nobody recognizes him. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, and he was he was um, pretty much one of these guys who would turn it on uh, when he was um, asked to or whether he was being paid to. But by himself, he was just a very modest guy who um, didn't even have like a Paul Freeze speaking voice in, in real life. He was just, you no, know, you've probably heard him interviews with him from the old days where he'd where he'd just say uh, i remember the first voice i ever was asked to do was a drunken bull you know that sort of voice and um so he was exactly like that in real life but he because we'd done these little bits together he just treated me as a total pro as if i'd been around for years and and i was asking him um Oh, you worked with another guy I know called Paul Freezy. Oh, yeah, sure, I know Paul. And then, then he sort of had this. <laughs> uh, he's a nut. <laughs> just stuff like, just stuff like that. You know? <laughs> uh, that was my memory of him. He he was he couldn't have been nicer. And he's he was because he'd been in a terrible accident back in 1961. He was walking with a cane for the rest of his life. And this is 85. Oh, wow. So I, little... I didn't know that. I knew about the accident, but I didn't know that he walked Ooh. with a cane forever. Holy oh yeah. Shoot. Every, every bone in his, every bone in his body was broken and oh. uh, he almost died. Uh, he was in a total full body cast for about three months. Mm -hmm. And um, so um, that was the lingering thing from that um, terrible road accident that he had. But uh, so, and also I knew that, um, you know, he was in his late seventies by then. So you could tell after we did the bit, his wife was with him and they, they were going to get back to the hotel. So of course I wanted to treat a, a senior guy with respect. So I was, I was just, I didn't try and gild it and say, I want to spend more time with him. You know, I just let him go, but uh, no, he was, he was, and, the, and he also wrote to me because I sent him some tapes of some old radio shows that he didn't have copies of that he'd done years before. So yeah, he was great. You know? It's yeah. All these people, they, they were all, they might have been a little forbidding if you were just a fan who who didn't do voices and hadn't had the the history of building up this repertoire of voices for years and years. But if you got to know them and they weren't threatened by you, they were just terrific. Yeah, very modest. I think they enjoyed all of them. To to anyone I can think of, they enjoyed the fact that it was kind of anonymous in a way what they did. So they weren't like movie stars where you know I think. Uh, the Dick Cavett once said that uh, Elvis Presley, people like that, the the degree of fame that they had was like, well, you know, just take your clothes off and walk down the street. That's what it must feel like, you know. That oh constant. My God. <laughs> yeah, oh. but uh, so I think I think all these great voice people were really happy to be behind the scenes and not really known by the public, especially in those days before the internet. You know, they were very anonymous. It was really only people in the industry or cartoon buffs like yourself who knew about them in real life you know mm -hmm. otherwise they were just oh yeah some crazy person must do that bugs bunny voice i don't know who he is you know that 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 was what most of the public were like back then now mm -hmm. because of the explosion of uh, of you know the way we live now everyone knows who mel blank is you know mm -hmm. as it and, should be and as you were saying you know you know, everyone knows who the voice of Bugs Bunny is. I've been looking forward to this one for a while because you have doubled for Bugs Bunny. When I say doubled, for any of the right. listeners who don't know, uh, I mean, Bob Bergen talked about this when he came on this show a while back. Right. I know Bob. Yeah. Yeah. Bob Bob was one of the first guests, actually. Ah, uh, right. Um, yeah. yeah no, he's but, a very nice man. Yeah. He absolutely is a very nice man. Very funny, too. I've learned. Yes, yeah. I've learned a lot. I, he taught me Porky stutter. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I see, I see people get tongue tied and they're like, eh, but, it, yeah. it, but it, that's all folks. And I'm like, yeah, you're doing that totally wrong. They're like, shut up, James. 
<laughs> they don't care. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's right. But uh, what I mean by voice double is um, since the passing of Mel Blanc and Bill Scott, Paul Fries, Dawes Butler, and Don and Don Messick, um, who, if any of the listeners don't know, because I know we didn't mention him, Don Messick was Scooby Doo and Boo Boo Bear. Yep. Um, the Ranger since- isn't gonna like this, Yogi. <laughs> And since uh, a lot of those ones have now passed on, um, they, usually producers audition different voice actors to um, perform the characters for different stuff. And so, Keith, you've been lucky enough to do basically a lot of the major uh, cartoon characters, including Bugs Bunny right. and Daffy Duck, Elmer Fudd. So I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Like I've been telling my friends, I'm going to be interviewing the voice of Bugs Bunny. <laughs> so. <laughs> So and and they've been looking forward to this one as well. Uh, oh, good, good. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. well, I, I remember when when I did Bugs Bunny, um, I had to do a, an audition of um, <clears throat> some something they sent me that was an old radio show that he appeared on, Mel Blanc, mm-hmm. right, with the original guy who did Elmer Fudd, Arthur Q. Bryan, you know, and so um, it was sponsored by Life Boy Soap, and so Bugs <laughs> Bunny came on in his little guest shot going. The name of the soap is Life Boy. The name of the soap is Life Boy. Me, yeah. what's up, Dad? You know, so it was like that. And then uh, I'll get that wascoey wabbit if it takes me the west of the program. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's 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 me laughing uh, at that. That was funny. I well, he was he was a guy who was most mostly in, in other shows. He just used his normal. But he had this one voice that he did where he couldn't pronounce the letter R and L, and it'll, they all both came out as W. So that's how, you know, he was doing that voice on radio, Arthur Q. Bryan, before they put him in cartoons. He was doing it on comedy shows. And the, I think it was Tex Avery who who said, I'm going to use that voice for this character I've got. It wasn't Elmer Fudd. The first time it was in a, a parody of the old... Um, uh, Dangerous Dan Magoo, you know, in the, it was in like a 1939 Merry Melody. Didn't have regular characters. It was just one of those Tex Avery send-ups. And yeah. um, so he was a little guy who came in to this bar where all these big guys were beating the hell out of each other. And, gentlemen, please stop this violence. You know, <laughs> like it, it was just so bizarre hearing that voice in an animated cartoon. So then when they came up with The Hunter... Which was eventually named Elmer Fudd. He that's that's how he became famous for that cartoon character. Mm-hmm. But um, he went. He died in fifty nine, I think. Mm-hmm. Arthur Q. Bryan. I didn't get to meet him because I was mm-hmm. only a kid then. You know. Yeah. Um, and and of course, uh, you know that that character eventually got taken over by people like uh, Hal Smith and Mel yes. Blanc. Uh, there was another. Exactly. Th- th- uh, there, there's one cartoon actually. Um, where bugs fall, uh, basically he's trying to avoid uh, being hunted by Elmer and then jumps over like this pile of rocks and somehow falls down a hole and Elmer Fudd loses track of bugs and he's like, oh, Dwight, that blasted wabbit. Where is he? But it was a different <laughs> voice actor, so it, it had oh, more of a... Yeah, um, uh, yeah Dave, uh, Dave Barry, that was. That was thank, you. Dave. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, yes. Barry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. He he, he um, told me that he did that. That's right. I didn't. Oh, you, oh, you knew him. Okay, cool. Oh, I met Dave Barry uh, in 1995 at okay. some of these old radio pioneers things. I used to go back and forth to Hollywood so often in those days that I got to all these people. But uh, he told me he also did uh, kind of a Donald Duck sneeze on one of the Capitol records with Bugs Bunny. But that was with Mel Blanc. He worked with Mel Blanc, mm-hmm. and he used to do voices for some of the Warner Brothers cartoons back in the. God, the mid forties, I think. Okay. He did the Great Gildersleeve on uh, a Bugs Bunny cartoon called Hair Conditioned, where he's in a department store, and um, <clears throat> and he's got a, a deep voice saying, "Oh rabbit, <laughs> come here." And um, so that that was Dave Barry. He he had a deep baritone voice, but he could mimic other voices. Mm-hmm. But I don't think the Elmer Fudd was such a great imitation. But I don't think those guys. But as long El- as they, Elmer Fudd's kind of, hard, it really is. It, it, well, it is. You got to, the, the the main thing is is um, <clears throat> to do it pro- properly. You've got to get Arthur Q. Bryan, the original guy's resonance in it, mm-hmm. and and that's that that uh, kind of quirky uh, sound that he had. Why you wascoey wabbit? I'm gonna get you. 
Oh, 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 oh Wabbit. You know, and then he'd have these crying fits and things. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I will say, like, if Arthur Q. Bron- I was th- I was just thinking about this, actually. You were talking about Dave Barry doing Elmer Fudd. Um, mm-hmm. And mostly I just, you know, think about that co- that one cartoon. Uh, right. And, and I'm sure you know how the rest of it goes on. But for any of the listeners who don't, uh, basically, when Bugs falls underground, he discovers um, an old uh, film that's, like, in some kind of a time capsule that is in foreign writing. That's... So, so he brings it back to his uh, his hole, turns on the movie, and it's like this prehistoric times film that's basically a prehistoric version of Bugs and Elmer's chases. And so it's like, uh, let us meet our biggest hunter, Elmer Fudstone. And Bugs is not fooled. That's He's right. like, oh, it's just an ancestor. So it's like, be very, very quiet. Me hunt saber tooth rabbit. And <laughs> I remember Ar- it now. Yeah. Yep. And if Arthur Q. Bryan was doing the Elmer Fudstone character, that would have been a totally different character, I think. Yes. I'm I'm looking it up because uh it's in this filmography of this uh this book that I did. Oh nice. It was called Prehysterical Hair. Prehysterical Hair, Hair yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was actually in 58. I, I had I said 59, it was wrong. Um and it was, yeah, Elmer Fudd and Fudstone. That's right. Mm-hmm. He also, I think Dave Barry told me he also did a sound of a, like, a, what do they call those flying creatures from prehistoric times? Pterodactyls? He, yeah, he did a pterodactyl yell in that as well. So, Oh, wow. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of times they'd come in and um, they'd have a role to play. And suddenly the director would say, hey, listen, before you go, we're going to have this uh, background thing. So it was just, you know, if you're a, if you're a voice pro, you just take what's given to you. You you never know. You turn up to the studio not knowing what you're going to be asked. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So um, did so uh, when you were doing all of the uh, Looney Tunes stuff, like uh, the ads and the theme park stuff, did you ever audition right. for like TV shows and movies? Uh, not then, because most of that was all happening in the U.S. and and okay. my role was to do those characters for Warner Brothers with their approval for the below the equator countries, like everywhere from Australia, New Zealand and Singapore and all those places that would have, um, especially the theme park things, because at that time after Mel Blanc died, these Warner Brothers had this, um, oh, what was it called? Warner Brothers Consumer Products, this big company that was worldwide and they were trying to really start all these studio stores and sell all the Warner Brothers t-shirts and all of that. So they were trying to really plus up their their exposure around the world the way Disney had done for years, you know, with mm-hmm. their with their characters. Because I think they felt they'd they'd let the ball fall for a while with Bugs and Daffy and all of these great characters that should have been more well known at that time than just cartoons on TV. So I was doing a lot of um recording you know soundtracks for these little stage productions that would play at all these big shopping malls around all the you know all the countries below the equator as i said and um then of course you'd have people coming out in in costume as tweety sylvester uh you name it miming to the track that i'd recorded so they tended to be those sorts of shows that uh, a lot of audience participation with little kids and that. But uh, I think they um, they were pleased because it did get the characters. And they were doing the same thing in America with some of the guys there. I think Bob Bergen had done some of those theme park things. And uh, um, I did a couple for one of them ended up in England as a stage show, as a musical with Bugs and Daffy. And I, I can't even remember what it was called. Um but I was doing, you know, some of some of the commercials that we did were animated and they looked really good. They I think the people in, in Burbank was were pleased because they the the animation guy really wanted to pay tribute to the old cartoons. So they looked as good as he, he could get them, whatever budget they had. And we even did one where we did the two Mexican crows, you know, and um, I can't think what the product was, but it was that, hey man, well, what are you doing? You know, wow, you tell me, you know, that, that, uh, I think it was a cartoon called Two Crows from Tacos that Frizz Freeling had directed. Mm-hmm. And, um, so we did that, but mostly it was Bugs or Daffy or, but the biggest and the ones they were really trying to push be, for the younger market, I think, was Tweety and Sylvester because, uh, so with Tweety, 
again, what we did was we took an old track from one of the uh, cartoons where he's singing, I'm a I'm a poor little bird in a gilded cage. And Queenie's so they, my name, but I don't yeah, know my age. Ah, uh, yeah, you're you're good. Um, but uh, again, slowed it down. And I remember in so, I think when Mel when I met Mel Blank, he said, "Yeah," he said, "I think they," he said, "I think they slowed it down by like seventeen percent." My voice, and we tried that on an old Studer reel to reel mastering deck, and it worked. It sounded exactly. When you when you slowed the track of Tweety down off the cartoon, there was Mel Blank going, "I'm a poor little bird in a gilded cage," <laughs> and you, it was like you could hear his voice, <laughs> and it was like, "Ah, that's what they." Because then they played it back at normal speed, and it was sped up, and it sounded like this little bird character, you know. So, um, it, it sounds like old technology, but boy, they really solved those problems back in those days, and uh, so. <clears throat> I ended up imitating Mel Blank by doing every Tweety commercial like that. Mm -hmm. Whatever the product was. I, oh, I I thought I tore putty tat. And then if that was sped up 17%, it sounded exactly like Tweety in the cartoon. It was amazing. And um and then uh, and Sylvester was easy enough to do because as even Mel Blank said, that Sylvester was the character he felt was closest to his own speaking voice. Because right. if you take that uh, that Mel Blank sound and then just just add the the spitting thing, you know, it it suddenly becomes uh, that that whole. And that was really what made Mel Blank so good. It was it showed you what a a fine character actor he was because it was the same kind of the same spitting thing that Daffy Duck had, but you never think of Daffy and Sylvester as being the same voice. The 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 characterization and the the um the acting of it are two totally different characters. Mm. It's so funny You're... because one of my friends from college uh, asked me, right. uh, are Daffy and Sylvester played by the same guy? Because they, yeah. they have a list yeah, yeah, and I'm right. like, and I'm like, it's not just Daffy and Sylvester that are done by the same guy. It's the whole nine yeah. yards. And it's like, yes. wait, and he's like, wait, yeah. one guy is doing all of that. <laughs> I'm like, well, for the most part, yes. Like yeah. the same guy that does Daffy and Sylvester is doing Bugs and Tweety and Yosemite Sam oh, yeah. and Porky Pig and Pepe Le Pew and uh, Marvin the Martian, which is my favorite. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Hey, Marvin, God, yeah. Again, um, that was one that I I had to do for some commercial, and and uh, well, isn't was that the... lovely? <laughs> yes, I'm I'm going to blow up the the planet Earth. Um, yeah, it well, obstructs that's my view of Venus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> isn't that lovely? Hmm? <laughs> that was again one of the voices uh you can hear mel blank doing that in 1938 um mm -hmm. not as a martian but a, i think as a, a referee in a in a boxing match with daffy duck um no hitting below the belt and of course he remembered that voice and used it years later <laughs> oh that's funny so uh <clears throat> but and, and and yeah that would be that I guess my head exploded like that when I was a kid, learning that um, Mel Blank did all those things because it was misleading. He because he he was contracted, he was allowed to get a screen credit after 1944, and um, all of the other people who came in to do like uh, B. Benadaret, who did the first Granny, and uh, Arthur Q. Bryan, and people like that, w they were just day players who were contracted just just for that job. They were not under a studio contract, so they they were not eligible to get screen credit in those days. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you know, and now, of course, the guy who brings in the lunches to the the, the crew gets a credit on screen. But uh, <laughs> in those days, it was pretty selective. But uh, um, and of course, when it, the first person I ever knew as a multi voice was Doris Butler, even before I knew that Mel Blank. Um, because as I said, the, as a little kid, the first cartoon I ever really fell in love with was Huckleberry Hound Show. And it was, I think my mother had read some story about Doris Butler in the late fifties. And she told me this one man does Yogi Bear and Huckleberry Hound. Cause I saw their names. I said, Doris Butler, Don Messick. It said voice. That's all it said, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, I didn't know who was who. Even on the Jay Ward cartoons, Doris Butler told me in that very first letter to me that um, Bill Scott never took a credit for voices, you see. He was only uh, co-producers, Jay Ward and Bill Scott. That was it. 
and I, I, I said, I know I can hear you in all the fractured fairy tales and the Aesop and Sun cartoons, but who is doing Bullwinkle and Mr. Peabody and Dudley Durright and all the, and he said, oh, that's, that's Jay Wood's partner, Bill Scott. He's a better voice man than all of us. You know? <laughs> <laughs> So it was amazing, you know? yeah. So, what was it like to voice all of the classic Hanna Barbera characters for the Celebrity Gala Night at Australia's Wonderland? Yeah, you you've seen things I've forgotten that I did, but uh, again, they were great jobs because um, they'd give you a, a lot of time, and it, again, it was like recording a cartoon. You'd do all of the lines for Huckleberry Hound first, and then maybe all the lines for uh, Yogi Bear. And they'd do all the cutting together and, you know, editing it and turning it into a story um, so that you could stay consistent as one character, you know. And I, right. I was, again, I was I was blessed because I, I think back now, I, I have a tape that Doris Butler sent me. And we didn't, when Corey was still in school, we went to his house in, back in 73 and he recorded it, our conversation without us knowing because he had a, a proper home studio with those old fashioned radio type mics, you know, in, in, in hanging down from the ceiling and um or like suspended on a boom i mean and um, right. and then he said i've done a surprise i've recorded our conversation because we were asking him all sorts of questions and it was like this fantastic memento and and he was even talking about how he does certain characters to us you know and he said um he said the big one he said, i just expand my chest and and suddenly i'm going yogi bear mr ranger sir and 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 then he'd, he'd suddenly just go from that without even a pause and say, of course, Huckleberry Hound, Huckleberry Hound just sort of flows, you know. So he, he'd just do all that. And then, but he said his favorite was Mr. Jinx because it was of that, you know, the humor in that character. You know, he'd get hit by, smack, smack his head into a wall chasing the meese and, and he'd be almost unconscious saying, uh, then I may get the uh, number of that truck, you know, and, um, so he loved Mr. Jinx, and so did Joe Barbera. He said that was Joe Barbera's favorite character. Right. So um, it was just just terrific, and uh, it was almost like getting lessons from the guys who came up with the voices themselves. Nice. Without formally having, you know, with years, it was. I think it was like two and a half years later he developed the Doris Butler Workshop mm. after we we'd known him for you know as these super fans, and. Uh, became his first student. He, he let me become a student, even though I was based in Sydney, Australia. And, and he said, um, oh, I, I, I can brag. I've got an international student. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So you've been uh, talking about working with all of these animation legends, Bill Scott and Jay Ward. That kind of makes me wonder, did you get to know Chuck Jones at all? Oh, yeah, very well. Okay. Uh, he was great. In fact, he wanted to use me um again it was around around the time of warner brothers big thing like mel blank had died in 89 mm -hmm. and chuck jones came to australia in 1990 um because by that time he was attending a lot of galleries around the world and you know signing cells and things and um we did a radio interview together and i was doing some of the, the lines from his his cartoons and um he he uh, again um, said, look, uh, I'd like to use you. I've got a project coming up called Barnaby Scratch. And apparently this was something he'd been talking about for years and never got to do it because uh, he he died 10 years after anyway. But uh, And I think he aged fairly quickly a couple of years after that trip to around the world. Um, but he wanted me to do like a, like a, the voice Paul Freeze used to use for Toucan Sam, which was like Ro this actor Ronald Coleman from the old early days of talkies, who was in many cartoons imitated. Uh, you, do you know Ronald Coleman's voice? Uh, I mean, I, I remember Toucan Sam. Well, you'd Sam. know it. Yeah. You wouldn't know it because if you if you remember King Leonardo, he was the little skunk Odie Colony. Okay. I, 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 don't, I don't think voice. I know that one. But... Oh, you don't? Oh, okay. I don't think so. Uh, also in the George of the Jungle cartoons, he was, I think it was, yeah, it was, um, you, know, you know, it's weird. I grew up with the George of the Jungle reboot, uh, from like, yeah. <laughs> uh, from when I was a kid, I actually interviewed right. George from George of the Jungle, uh, whose name is Lee Toker. And I got him to oh, sing, yes, the yes. I got him to sing the George right. of the Jungle theme song with me. Right. Right. 
You did not see oh, that well, coming. Anyway, anyway you, if, if you catch up with some of the old cartoons at some stage, you'll definitely hear it because it was the original ape in in the um, in the cartoons from 1967. Okay. was Paul Frees doing this Ronald Coleman voice, which was like, uh, ah, yes, George, that... Um, the district commissioner will be visiting us this afternoon, George. And that was the voice based on Ronald Coleman that, that Chuck Jones wanted me to do for this Barnaby Scratch character. I think it was going to be a little grasshopper or something. For I, I really can't remember. It's so long ago. But he was talking about it in the breaks while they were, they were playing commercials on this uh, interview that we did. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, he, he was again, I mean, he was kind of so legendary that uh, he was... Often, even even when I got to know him, he was in a hurry because these people were whisking him from one thing to the next event that he had to go to. So I didn't get to know him as much as I'd like to, apart from one um, barbecue that we did at the Warner Brothers guy's house, um, where me and the guy who was doing the animation for the local commercials got got to ask him a lot of questions in a very relaxed evening because he he didn't have any pressure, you know. And oh, we were asking all sorts of trivia about old cartoons. That was a one of the first opportunities I had to ask him about my topic about um, cartoon voices, you know, the history of them. Right. Have, have you seen that that book that I've, uh, or heard about the book that I've just done called Cartoon Voices of the Golden Age? Uh, I, I think I might have, actually. Yeah, well, it's, this is the book. It's got all of these, um, these characters on it, on the cover. Um, but uh, <laughs> that, that, I remember that evening I was talking to him because he said, I'm not really, I don't really have a great memory for some of the voices that I used years and years ago. It was just one day of my life, you know, but I, I, I lucked out because I said, well, there was one 1939, it was called Daffy Duck and the Dinosaur. And uh, the little Casper Caveman character was like spoken like an imitation of Jack Benny. And gosh, well, you'd be grouchy too, first thing in the morning. And he said, oh, yeah. He said, that was that was Jack Lescooley, um, who was a young actor. And then he became one of the co-hosts years later of the American Today Show. Um, but I said, oh, Jack Lescooley, I haven't heard of him. He said, yeah. And the reason he remembered that was he said, yeah, he, he used to play tennis with my animator, Phil Munro. So he remembered little things like that, you know. But it was that was the fact that he he gave me that name was the trigger for my 30 year obsession of starting to research all these actors who, who never got a credit and did voices alongside Mel Blanc and so on. So um, I've got Chuck Jones to thank for that. <laughs> hmm. um, so earlier we were talking a little bit about the uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle movie. And as I said, I really do like that film. And what I really right. do like, what I really like about it is that um, it basically sort of at least in their universe takes place where Rocky and Bullwinkle left off and kind of breaks the fourth wall a little bit. They're all getting residual right. checks for the reruns, but, <laughs> but nothing really is happening for them. And actually just right. after I got, uh, I, I had heard from you about doing the show. I went back mm -hmm. and watched it on my VCR. Right. Yeah. I have a VHS tape of it. Oh, um, good. <laughs> it's uh it's it's a really really funny movie. I love that it brings uh, the classic Rocky and Bullwinkle characters with the, yeah. I guess then current times. It was oh so sure that was, yeah that was yeah. amusing and a lot of breaks of the fourth wall. Of, hey, Rook, your face is all blurry. So is yours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so you, my so you favorite did... one was the uh, the one where uh, the the narrator is saying. Uh, and the <clears throat> Rocky and Bullwinkle were in a foreign and hostile landscape. And Bullwinkle says something something back to him. He's, do you want to narrate this movie? No. <laughs> yeah. That was one of my favorites too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then and the, also and, in the George yeah. of the Jungle movie. Have you seen that one with Brendan Fraser? I long time ago, yes. Yeah. That was a that was when my favorite moment of that, because I was just the disembodied narrator in that, was uh, when one of the villains where, where the narrator says something and, and he looks up into the sky and says, you shut up. He says, I will not. <laughs> so it was such a bizarre moment that a guy would talk back to a narrator. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very, yeah. Very yeah. Jay Ward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there was uh, one where it was like uh, Rocky was Rocky was so cold that he could not fly at all. I could fly if I had to. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. I remember yeah. seeing June Perret at the microphone. She was so tiny. She was like four foot, four foot 11. And uh, doing that movie. She, 
Sorry? Doing that movie she was? Yes, yeah. Okay. I, I remember seeing her at the microphone recording those lines for that movie, and we were both in the same room together. And she was pulling that exact face that you go, I could if I want to. <laughs> I can fly if I want to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you also got to do the animated versions of Fearless yeah. Leader and Boris in it. And of course, in the right. in the live action sequences, the bad guys were done by, <laughs> I love the fourth wall break there. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They were pulled from the TV and turned into major Hollywood motion picture stars, <laughs> which were <laughs> Robert De Niro for Fearless Leader, who yes. nailed it. Um, yes, yes. Rene Russo doing Natasha and Jason Alexander from Seinfeld as uh, right. I almost said almost said George Boris. George yes, is a right. Seinfeld character. Um it and, is. And, yeah. and Robert De Niro also produced the movie. Uh did you he get did, to know him? Yeah. What was it called Tribeca Productions? That's his production company. He would often do movies like the Rocky and Bullwinkle thing because um for for his more artistic work, he needed to fund it. So he would he would make his money doing a lot of movies people say oh i didn't think robert de niro should do that you know well he was quite happy to do it and take the money (laughs) (laughs) um but uh he was he was terrific to work with i couldn't believe it you know he he um i think he he because on a movie you always do a table reading of the script with everyone right the crew and the cast and it's where everyone meets each other and you read the script well this this movie was I suddenly, you know, realized I got really scared that morning because I suddenly realized on this particular movie, I'm going to be in the same round table, this huge table with Robert De Niro and all these people looking at me. And for the first five pages, it's just me because there's an opening narration. Then there's the cartoon Bullwinkle. Then thank God June Foray was there because it was like the two of us against all these people just staring. Mm -hmm. Well, laughing their head off. You know, I was suddenly, I was suddenly changing from this voice into that voice, you know, and all of that. And it was like, um, and all these professionals were all going, how do you do that? And I'm thinking, you guys are asking us that sort of thing, you know. <laughs> but I think there was a fascination with these, um, these on-camera actors with people like us who had a specialized area of, of ability, you know. So um, they could, I, and again, I think it was that thing that because we both jumped in and started doing all this stuff in this movie and we just did it like professionals, they really admired that. There was no sort of, um, oh, what's my motivation and all this sort of nonsense. It was just straight in and we just started doing it and it energized everyone else and they all started being at the same energy level. So it was really amazing. There was a dialect coach there who was helping Jason Alexander with his Boris thing and he was watching us sort of shaking his head and he spent his whole life you know, around voices and so on. So it was, it was just one of those weird, again, one of those moments that uh, I can look back on and think, my God, I lived through that morning with all these, these you know, there was Randy Quaid and uh, John Goodman and all these actors, you know, sitting around the table. Well, that's cool. I know that John Goodman was in the movie, but I remember yeah. from Bob Bergen and Brian Cummings, you know, that's, you usually record right. separately. So but 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 if they were going to be <clears throat> because they were reading the whole dialogue of the movie, I think right. the only one who couldn't make it that day was Whoopi Goldberg because um, he was the judge in in one of the scenes, mm-hmm. <clears throat> the courtroom thing, and um, but almost all of the others except except Billy Crystal because that was obviously such a tiny bit part when he had the mattress on his back. And, yeah. Um, but uh, but even even the, that day, I can remember. I had to travel with the movie. If you remember Roger Rabbit, um, the guy who did the voice of Roger was Charlie Fleischer. And he was the first one, I think, once they invented CGI. And that was back in 88. So it was 10 years before the Rocky and Bullwinkle film. But uh, he was traveling with the movie the whole time and standing there while they were shooting the scenes if Roger was needed as a voice. Right. And I think the idea behind that was that up until then they'd call the voice actor in at the end of the whole thing to record it properly. And usually in those days, they would get some crew member to read the line, say Roger or Bullwinkle or something. But he set this kind of precedent where the actors were really happy with it because they got to hear the real voice and not just a crew member reading the lines badly, you know, like, uh, so all of these actors were really happy that, uh, that um, they were hearing Rocky and Bullwinkle while they were doing the shoot, you know, because I guess it just helped them get into the whole thing, even as nonsensical as it was. 
But the, the all I can remember about that movie it was two weekends in a row, Robert De Niro insisted that June Foray and I go down to his hotel and re rehearse with him because that, that's what a, a a trained actor he was. He, he wanted to have rehearsal with the characters, even though they were cartoon characters. So uh, he he went to the whole thing and, and put on this really expensive uh, cakes and coffees and all sorts of things for us on two weekends in a row and... Uh, you know, and we were doing the scenes with Fearless Leader, and um, and I, he also had a little reference of some of the old cartoons from the TV show that he would constantly look at and and try to get into the head of <laughs> this Fearless Leader dictator character, mm -hmm. and um, and and then he also had other mad mad leaders as little film references just to see what their approach was. And uh, he had Doctor No from the first James Bond movie, who was similar to Fearless Leader. Yeah, and um, and of course and his I, own very iconic line: "Are you yeah. talking to me?" Like, and he yes, did it. from for Taxi Driver. Yeah. For any of the listeners who don't who have never seen the Rocky and Bullwinkle movie, as I said, Robert De Niro is Fearless Leader, and right. there's a scene where he's getting a hold of Boris and Natasha. Have you liquidated Moose and Squirrel? <laughs> yeah, that's I, right. <laughs> how come they never knew their friggin' names? They were just moose and squirrel. Yeah. Like just were randomly chasing a moose and squirrel for no good reason. Yeah. Yeah. And they, <laughs> yeah. Um, so basically, um, they have not captured moose and squirrel yet. And right. so uh Boris and Natasha are kind of stammering, and Robert De Niro says, Are you talking to me? <laughs> but then who else are you talking to? I'm the only one here, so you must be talking to me, which of course is a reference to his very own line. I once saw, in, in I once Texas saw, driving. yeah, I once saw Roger Ebert uh, saying, "Why shouldn't he rip that off? Everyone else has." Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, it was it was bizarre because I I was a fan of the old movie. You know, it was one of the mm -hmm. first biggies with uh, Martin Scorsese, and uh, and I remember it was it was his own voice back then. It was like, "You talking to me? You talking to me? You talking to?" I'm the only one here. So you must be now talking to me. All right. Go ask for it. <laughs> you gotta go for your gun. <laughs> and then for You gotta to be sleeping with the fishes. Just... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um that was bizarre, you know, seeing seeing De Niro do that. I was mm -hmm. in the studio that day watching him do about and he must have done like twenty takes because again, being more of a method trained actor. I think he wanted to discover what was in him and do variations of the delivery. Mm -hmm. But it was all, always the same with that sort of thing. I, I think often often they'll end up using one of the early takes because they're the ones that the crew laugh at, you know. So, it's like, everyone's going to laugh at this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he was, it was just just wonderful to work with somebody like Robert De Niro and, and, and um, yeah. just have, it, have him trust June Foray and myself is just these behind the scenes pros who just knew what we were doing and we were in a kind of a specialized area of the the acting business I guess is how he he processed it you know mm -hmm. so yeah. to wrap it up uh, are you working on anything right now that you can talk about nothing nothing big uh, at the moment um, a lot of that stuff has kind of died out until they maybe reboot it and 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 the, I ended up having being replaced as Bullwinkle, as you probably know. Uh, in yep. I think it was a CGI cartoon. I think that accompanied the Peabody thing. But so I had from I had my thirty years of it, which I, I'm grateful for forevermore. From 1992, when I first did a Universal theme park attraction with June Foray and Corey Burton. On that one, he was doing the Bill Conrad narration voice. Um, but that was seven years before the movie. And so I had, uh, I, essentially I had like, you know, 25 years doing these voices in America, even though I was living in Australia, doing them on commercials and cartoons and things. So it didn't really bug me, you know, when I think a new, a new person comes in and grabs the rights, it wasn't universal anymore. It was DreamWorks and they usually make a clean sweep, you know, all of us like, Jeff Bergman and people like that have, have had times where we've been replaced by somebody else. And then eventually Jeff Bergman came back. So who knows, maybe one of these days, if they, you know, try to reboot the classic era of Bullwinkle and Rocky rather than a new look, they may come back to me. But uh, essentially at the moment, I think I'm just, you know, just doing the occasional 
a voiceover on a commercial and things, and it's it's almost gone back to the the very beginnings. I mean, one thing, the only other thing I forgot to mention was that uh, another thing that really got me into the voiceover field very early was that um, William Hanna from Hanna Barbera was in Sydney at the same time I was writing to Doris Butler and all these people, setting up an Australian branch of Hanna Barbera to do outsourced, outsourced animations, not just commercials. They were animating some of the American series at that time, like Funky Phantom and Wait Till Your Father Gets Home in Sydney. So again, I took in my letters from Doris Butler and uh, he was just amazed, you know, that uh, here's this guy he'd worked with 15 years doing Rough and Ready and everything up to Funky Phantom. And um, so he gave me a job working around the Hanna-Barbera Cartoon Studio when I was like 18, you know, and uh, it- Good for you. I, yeah, I got to know all the animators and see how they put cartoons together. And uh, he kind of just knew that even though I wanted to become a voice guy, he said, well, maybe I'll educate him about how the whole cartoon process works, you know? So that's again. And then when, when because it was seasonal, um, you know, suddenly you were laid off because there was no work for a little while. So mm -hmm. by then I'd done a really rough sort of a demo and it was probably awful to listen to now, but, uh, but uh, he could see. And uh, so he gave me, a reference on paper that I've still got this, this letter on HB, you know, stationery saying um, I've listened to Keith Scott and I would recommend him to any agent who wants to take him on as a multi-voice talent signed William Hanna, Hanna Barbera productions. And of course with his credibility, an agent just snapped me up straight away. And I, I mean, I always think back now, I thought it wasn't even ready because I hadn't fully developed whatever voice talents I have. But um, thanks to Bill Hanna, I got into it very quick. And the best thing you can do if, you, if you're thrown in the deep end is you learn real quick how to be a, a professional and work with older actors and so on. So I just wanted to mention that was a, a very important part of the whole history of my crazy career. And what a career it's been, you know, getting to do all of the classic animated characters. Uh, you know, right. I mentioned most of them in the intro and we uh we're talking a lot about them uh that's all i've got here is there anything else you want to say to wrap up not really i mean if you i mean once you put this together and and cut it together and get rid of all my ums and ahs um the, you may want to play the you know there's you can just source that demo off my website um which okay. is either link, the, li the one. link in the description if anybody wants to check it out yeah it's just um keith scott one word, you know, keithscott.com.au for Australia. The old one was right. just dot com, but somebody uh, hacked it, so it was that's cool. Oh. But uh, whatever, um, whatever dot com means. I know. I, yes. I still, <laughs> I still don't. I still don't know that. No, no. I, I, I think. Uh, oh God, I can't even remember if the com means commercial back way back when it first began. But we used to do a joke about the the woman in in the most famous movie of all of them all, Citizen Kane. Uh, Orson Welles used this actress called Dorothy Comingore, uh, who was um, the the would be opera singer who embarrassed herself, and uh, so we used to say, well, gee, if Dorothy Comingore was still around, she'd have a website say dot com dot com. <laughs> <laughs> That's that, funny. That was... That was one of the first ever internet jokes I wrote back in like 1990 when the internet was brand new. And we were like, you was wondering what the hell is this dot com? <laughs> I mean, here we are 30, nearly 35 yeah. years later, still don't know what the hell a dot com no, is. No, no. And, but it, and that but it works. Years, yeah. I can tell you, it's gone so quickly. It's just, I can, it seems like yesterday to me in my memory when email first came along and I was a late adopter of it, you know, I was, oh no, that will, that'll never, yeah. You know, I'm scared of the technology because like all old is, you know, once, once you use it and you realize how user friendly it is now, you can't live without it. Of course. Mm -hmm. Well, Keith, thank you very much for joining me for nostalgia talk. Thank you, James. I appreciate it very much. And, uh, you probably had no idea. I was such a motor mouth, but, uh, <laughs> at least I'm, don't, at least hey, I try to, fill me, in you know, you've got a lot of, you have a lot of good stories. You, uh, and as I've said, you've done a lot of the most legendary characters. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of good stories that come with that. Well, I thank you very much. And as Bugs, Bugs would say, ah, me public. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to all you guys listening to this, I will see you on the next Nostalgia Talk. And don't forget, there's lots of stuff coming. Peace.